Thank you for coming, and um, I'm glad to see all these faces, which I'm going to remember because I'm a, a research historical help me archive stalker. So, <laughs> so I, I'm looking for help. We're always looking for help in African American studies with the research. Um, I'm a collector first. I am um, a collector that will go anywhere by any means, mm -hmm. any mode of transportation, and in anything imaginable, I will do that to try to collect history. I think that there is a purpose and a drive in me that makes it a requirement for my happiness, well-being, and mental stability <laughs> to collect. And I enjoy it tremendously. I'm going to talk to you today about um, Bishop William T. Vernon. He was born in 19, 1871, and he died in 1944. And I'm going to say that again because it's part of what I'm getting ready to do. He was born in 1871, and he died in 1944. I met Bishop Vernon in 2006 at a flea market. I was hunting and looking and trying to find something that I could put in my collection, because there's always something, whether it's an album, a pamphlet, a jet, my old jet magazine, there's always something that I can find. And even though we were not formally introduced, I met him because I looked in a plastic bag that was sitting on the floor at a booth. And when I looked in that plastic bag, all I saw were black images, and that's all I need to see. And of course, the price was great. So that's how we met. Now, when I collect, I usually, pretty quickly after, try to figure out what was going on and who these people might be. So after a few days of kind of looking at my wonderful treasure, I'm trying to figure out what's going on in these images. Because there are people in suits, but there are also what appears to be native Africans. So I'm looking through the photographs and I find a name. And that's when our friendship began. Because as I started to investigate Bishop William T. Vernon, I became so fascinated so hungry for information and so grateful that we had met because we did meet and we've been together for years and I've been going through his genealogy, historical records and anything I can find that gives me information about him. And that's what I do as a collector. I want to know who they are, what did they do, what, who were these people, what were their lives like. So I began my journey into his life. And I can say four years later that we are great friends. I admire him. I am glad that the Vernon family had a son named William T. And I am very grateful for the purpose of collecting. So when, you're, when you are delving for information, a good researcher will go to every source. And there are great sources. You have a great source in special collections. If you have anything you need to know, the first place you should go is to your library. So I spent a lot of time in the libraries. I spent a lot of time on my computer. But in the course of that, I found a man who started out as an ordinary person and did extraordinary things. So that's my introduction to Bishop William T. Vernon. Bishop William T. Vernon was a African Methodist Episcopal bishop. He was born in 1871 in Lebanon, Missouri. He was, um, in, his father was an AME or African, I'm going to stop saying it over and over, <laughs> so I'm going to say AME, but African Methodist Episcopal minister. He went to school at Lincoln Institute in Jefferson City, Missouri, which was 
started right after the Civil War. And it was started by the, second, the 62nd Cavalry, Colored Troop, the United States Army. And they started, they started Lincoln Institute, and that's where he attended. After leaving there, he went to Xenia, Ohio, and attended Wilberforce College. And I don't know how many people know the history of Wilberforce, but it has been a black owned by the AME Church, higher education institution of learning. It has been around and still exists in Xenia, Ohio. And that's where he attended in his pursuits for a higher education. When he was 25 years old, he was called to be a minister, but he was also called to run a university called Western, which once again is an AME church university. So as we can see the pattern, AME church was a phenomenal source of energy, educational pursuits, and an uplifting of the race. So they were constantly building schools. And for that, we should be eternally grateful to the Af African Methodist Episcopal Church because they were instrumental in many of the colleges that still exist. And this was before emancipation. Uh, one of the reasons there were so many institutions in Ohio is because Ohio was a free state. And a lot of Methodist abolitionists lived in Ohio, built schools in Ohio, and Ohio became a mecca for higher education if you are African American. Uh, Bishop Vernon was a well-known Republican orator. Um, as you most sh should know or do know, most African Americans were Republicans because Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. So we were probably majority Republican until Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then there was a switching to the Democratic Party. But originally, most of the great leaders, Frederick Douglass, DuBose, all of these people were Republicans. So he was a great orator, and he did something that had never been done before, and that is that he was able to speak at a gathering for the Republican Party, where he gave a speech for Federal Day. And when he did that, that pushed him into another arena. And um, I think that as I was studying his life, one of the things that was so extraordinary were that he had all of these opportunities, but he was smart enough and aggressive enough, as I learned later, through going through records, to command, his presence commanded attention. It gave him a kind of different light on his life. So as he is progressing, he's 25 years old, he's head of a university, he's climbing up in the Republican Party. And he meets a lady named Emily Jane Emery. Her father was also an AME bishop. She also attended Wilberforce University. And when she graduated, she became a teacher at Western. She was teaching mathematics and Latin. And that's where she met William T. Vernon. And they married several years after that. She was a um, energetic, um, described as kind, very intelligent. Uh, not only did she write Latin, she spoke Latin and she taught Latin. And um, her mathematical pursuits um, are still recorded at Western of some of the things that she innovated. Her, her and her husband expanded the university, the buildings. The governor gave them money, which was another unheard of precedence because it's coming from a Republican legislation that was not necessarily um, sensitive to the needs of African Americans. So 
I think as we look back on it, I see people doing things that I don't know if I could have navigated that life because they're only 20 years, 30 years out of, out of uh, slavery. Their parents were born into slavery, but they have managed through the AME Church and their endeavors to educate themselves and move themselves up. Well, Bishop Vernon was working heavily in the Republican Party, recruiting, getting voter registration done. He was doing all these great things. And Teddy, President Theodore Roosevelt, um, caught his, he caught his eye. And they decided that they would make him register of the U.S. Treasury. So he was appointed in 1906 to be Register of the United States Treasury, which means that he had his signature on American currency. Um, he worked in the Treasury from 1906 to 1912. Um, President Roosevelt left office in 1911, and William Howard Taft decided to extend Reverend Vernon's, or Bishop Vernon's, um, uh, stay at the Treasury. So now he has been working for two presidents and he is now in a position to go and really do something back home. So he decides that he will do that one year under William Howard Taft and go back to Missouri. And so when he went back to Missouri, that's when he was appointed as a bishop of the AME Church. And he then became involved because once you get appointed in the AME Church because of their feelings about education and about spreading the word of the gospel, all bishops are assigned to some missionary station, wherever it may be. Bishop Vernon's assignment was to Cape Town, South Africa. So he was to Right after being a bishop, he was to go to Cape Town, South Africa. And him, him and his wife and his son got ready to become missionaries for the AME Church in South Africa. Um, I kind of, you know, I, I, when I first discovered the, the involved, their involvement with Cape Town, South Africa, I was wondering as a human being or as a woman, what kind of transition was that? <laughs> You know, here she is, um, a woman who does mathematics and Latin. Her son is still in school, secondary education, and um, they're going to Cape Town, South Africa. And this is quite a change in what they were used to and what they have been doing. And I'm going to give you some dates of how long the AME Church had been in South Africa by the time he went. In 1900, Bishop uh, Copland went to uh, South Africa. He spent four years. In 1904, Bishop C.S. Smith went to South Africa. He spent two years. In May 1908, Bishop Johnson went to South Africa. He stayed eight years. 1916, Bishop Beckett went to South Africa. He spent four years. And Bishop Vernon went to South Africa May 1920. And he remained there for four years. Now, a story of interest that I wanted to tell you about, and I, we don't have all the time. I wish I could tell you a lot of things, because I get excited about this, and I want everybody to know what happened. These historical facts are important to us because it gives us a different vision or a different view of life and lifestyles and what people did than we've ever been given before. That's the reason you have to support our library, our African American, uh, the African American collection they have. Go in there, look at it for yourself. Look at what a jet used to look like. Look at what an ebony used to be like. Read some of the 1802, 1804 newspapers about what was going on in the world in the United States. Read what Lincoln actually said in 1863 about emancipation. You empower yourself with knowledge. You give yourself a sense of what 
lives were like, then you know why your life is the way it is. All lives are the same. People live them. And we have to understand how we got here and why and what happened in this country. There were some wonderful things that happened because during all of this time when Bishop Vernon is packing his clothes, the Klan has gotten a resurgence. 1920 was a, a big year for them. So there was a lot of things going on, lynchings, burnings, uh, people were being denied rights. They were passing legislature that was keeping, taking the rights that were given to them away. So all of these things are going on, but he is getting ready to go to South Africa for his missionary work. And what happened was, is that they left on December the 2nd, 1920, was him and his wife. They had all the proper papers. I looked up their passports in the immigration records. And in their, on their passports, that's how I learned his father's name was Adam, because it's in his passport record. And in his passport, you can see that they have all of their stamps, all of their images, everything that they were supposed to have are in those passports. So they leave on December the 2nd, him and his wife. They leave, they go to London, England, in London, England, they have to now be, get through the immigration process. And as they are, they had letters of recommendation. Not only did Teddy Roosevelt write him a letter, but so did President William Howard Taft wrote him a letter. And the bishop, and it said that he was a bishop and he was a register, a former register of the United States Treasury. On December the 17th, 1920, um, Bishop Vernon and his family uh, embarked on, a, on their journey from at Southampton, England. That's where they boarded their ship um, for Cape Town, South Africa. They arrived on Saturday, January the 8th, 1921. And when they were ready to disembark on their arrival, they were detained by the immigration officers they were informed that they could not step on the land of South Africa because they were considered un undesirables. Um, they were escorted under guard to another ship, which was going back to England. So here they are, educated, learned people who are here to work with the church, build churches, build schools, and do whatever they can for the people of South Africa. So they, someone got in touch with the consulate, told them of their, what was going on in Cape Town, and they asked them to please allow them to land. They explained to them that they, the AME church had already had a charter since 1901 and that he was not the first bishop to come to South Africa, and that he, they needed to let him disembark and go about the business of the AME Church. They kept them for three days and three nights with guards with guns, and they gave them the reason to why they did not want them to enter their country, and they were detained under an immigration act of the Union of South Africa, number 22, which reads, any person or class of persons deemed by the minister on economic or on the account of standard and habits of life that are unsuitable for the people of this union or to any colored persons as of November 1913. So, what happened was the AME Church had all of their lawyers and scholars start sending letters by t and telegrams saying that they had to release them, that they have a right to be in that country, they have a charter to be in that country. And on the fourth day, two hours before the ship, the SS Dorm, was returning to England, because of the pressure on him from the president and former presidents of the United States, they allowed them to disembark and go into South Africa. She had, there is a letter in the special collections, or I hope I gave it to special collections, 
that Emily Vernon wrote to her friend. And in the letter, she describes a situation that she calls necessary but desolate because of the accommodations. They were literally living right up on the tribal grounds because they wanted to build these churches, they wanted to build schools. And in one of the photographs, you see one of the schools they actually build, and there she's teaching them just basics of mathematics. Um, in the letter, she talks about the dust, she talks about the language barrier, and she talks about the fact that there are other nationalities that are also in that area that are segregated and that are basically off limits to them. She expresses her desires to stay and do all she can and it is a very beautiful letter and <coughs> talks about the human character, or how people really when they are dedicated to what they believe, how they will live their lives regardless to the circumstances and the conditions. I think what I learned um, most from studying them are the how they overcame some some of the things I don't know if we could do it I don't know if we had the stamina or the wherewithal to endure those kind of humiliations and indignities um, Bishop Vernon stayed there four years and the church that's the finished product that they were determined to get done before they left all of these images, by the way, and probably maybe 50 more, are in special collections uh, documenting their lives. Um, that's the train that they stayed on for two weeks before they got accommodations in South Africa. They actually lived on that train. And it was not only them, but it was a delegate of three other families that came with them. Um, there you see some of the youth of the area, and they have their ostrich eggs, which they use for water. Um, so it was just like a thermos for them. They kept their water in that. They traveled with that because it was dusty, it was hot, and it was dry. So those are a lot of those are the kids, and that's uh, Bishop Vernon and his wife. There's uh, Bishop Vernon and some of the visiting delegates. Is what it says under the photograph. Visiting delegates. Uh, from the AME church that came to pay them a visit. That's Bishop Vernon, his son Adam, and his wife Emily. And over here, uh, these are probably people from the consulate because it was close. They could get there by horseback or by wagon um, as described in her letters. I am, um, and that's one of the groups of Africans and Americans from the AME Church uh, getting ready to lay the cornerstone for the new church. Um, Bishop Vernon, after doing four years, returned to the United States and the governor appointed him over Western University's Industrial Development uh, School. He stayed there and retired from there and him and Emily went back home. When she went back home, she decided to, to Missouri, um, she decided to do some work in the community and in the schools. Not only does she have a, a school named after her in Kansas City, Kansas, but also her husband. There's a Vernon Institute and the Emily Jane Vernon Institute. and. Um, because I'm a collector, this is the reason why. This is what makes collecting for me so magical, so wonderful, is that we can take objects that I find, and I have no idea what they are, I have no idea what they mean. I didn't know that uh, there were two black people on the 50 cent coin or silver dollar. I didn't know that until I found two. I didn't know so many things about my own culture and history until I found something that made me go research it, look it up, delve into it. I mean, I like to get in there, get into the records, check out their genealogy because these people are now my friends. I am a personal 
friend of Bishop William T. Vernon because I have been in his life on and off for the last four years. I want everybody in here to understand the importance of your family history because history really starts at home. And if you can get empowered by your family history, by what your grand, I mean, I don't know how many people in here even know their grandmother's maiden name or where she lived or any, those are things that are important because just like this man made me feel powerful, imagine with your own family, what you could find out. So we have to always remember history. We have to always support our African American studies or whatever you want to do, just do it with fury, do it with passion, because this is important. And I hope that somebody in here will be touched by it and it will become important to them, because we all have the power to make changes. And people like Bishop Vernon came before us, and he still lives, because he lives in me, and he'll live in the people who research him after this. So every life is important. He did wonderful things, but so did tens of thousands of other people. And we need to make it our business to find out, our community leaders, the people that went to UCF. Who were, who were they? Who was the first African-American student to graduate? All of those things are things that we can use to give to our children to help them to better understand the reason you are here and that's for higher education to better your lives and be a contribution to your community and your country. So I hope that you will support uh, Special Collections, look in the collection, maybe there's something in there you want to find out. But don't forget, we always like to have volunteers or people to help us out. <laughs> so if you feel that you got an hour or two, don't hesitate to not sleep in and come over to the school and give us a hand. I'm Carol Mundy. I collect African American artifacts, history, documents, pamphlets, photographs, anything. And if you got something you don't want, we have a repository. You don't want grandma's photographs? Give them to special collections. I know Lila's loving this. But <laughs> Give them the special collections. I just want to thank you. I want you to walk around and look at the photographs. Do you have any questions? Anybody want to know anything? Yes, Eric. <laughs> there are two stories that I have seen in your collection. There is the back story that you're, the forward story that you're telling us about Bishop Vernon, but there is also another story about how that bag of goodies got to be in that flea market, yard sale, estate sale, wherever you find it. What's, how does that? Well, I think what happens, and what I found, and I've been doing it for 25 years, I, I am the daughter of an antique collector named Carolyn Mundy. She didn't collect African American, but she amassed a wonderful collection of uh, Glass, Steuben, Lilique, and most of you don't even know what I'm talking about, but she was a collector. And as a kid, I was a little girl. She was dragging to the station wagon <laughs> to go with her because my brothers weren't required, but I was required. And I thank her now for the gift of collecting because I actually got it from her. But what I found, and when I came to Florida, now in Ohio, it was different because there was a lot of history around. We had, um, because we had Harriet Beecher Stowe was in uh, Cincinnati, um, a lot of abolitionists lived in Cincinnati. So Cincinnati was full of historical sites. I didn't even think about it at the time. But as a kid, I could walk through the Harriet Beecher Stowe house and look around and go down into the underground tunnels of Cincinnati. I didn't think about it. It was part of our everyday life. But what I found is, unfortunately, families do not regard. Now, I can't talk about other families. I can only tell you my experience with African American families, that if you inherit your grandmother's portrait or her mother's photographs, are you going to keep it? 
Or are you going to look at it and say, I don't know these people. I don't know what I would do with this. And it goes to the Salvation Army or the Goodwill. I could never have amassed 5,000 pieces, 27 life-size portraits from 1870s to the mid-1900s if somebody had not discarded them. And to me, that's a travesty. That we would take our family heirlooms and discard them in yard sales. And that's what happened. I go to flea markets, I know I'm going to find something. I'm not even worried about it. Whether it's a painting, a photograph, somebody's prized collection of jets from the 40s and 50s, because they're being discarded. And I think it's unfortunate that we don't care more about our history. I think that every family, regardless to racial background, should treasure their family's history. And I have been able to go to yard sales and looking, thinking, well, who would put this out? In fact, I was at a meeting once, and we were talking about collectors, and this lady asked me, do you feel guilty that you have been able to go out and get all these things for little or nothing? that now are very valuable. And no, I do not feel guilty, because if I hadn't gotten them, you wouldn't have be able to see them. I wouldn't be able to share it. I got them because I knew they were important. I got them because I was, I felt it was my purpose, my passion, and I did it with all of me. Even though I was a single parent of four kids, I found enough money to pay for my house, to pay for my kids, and to still have money to go out. They have numerous stories of my escapades. <laughs> Some of, two of my kids won't even go with me anywhere unless they know it's a movie or a restaurant. They're like, oh no, you're not getting ready to trick us. <laughs> so most people who know me, their experiences are that way. Because if I'm riding down the street and I see anything that I think that I can salvage, it breaks on. <laughs> I have my kid in the, in the trunk where I can change my shoes, put on a pair of pants, and I'm there. I don't care about getting dirty. I don't care if it's raining. I have taken signs off of buildings, and if I couldn't get the sign off, I paid somebody. Mm -hmm. You're like, uh, could you come over here and get that sign off? <laughs> so for me, the stories are there, it's just a lot of them. But it's because that passion and knowing that I have a purpose. Because why would anybody want to fill their house with straightening cones and plows and ice cream churns and scrub boards? To me, it's all beautiful. It's all wonderful. Because it's documenting history. And ordinary people is important. Our community, people who lived in our communities. I know everybody in here has a story about some lady or some man in their community. So when they said I had OCD, it was OK. I'd be like, are you still going to help me? <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm crazy, but could you help me get this in the car? <laughs> so I think what Eric is bringing out is that we need to be really mindful I mean, I don't know if you even know what your grandmother has, but I bet if you go through it, there'll be something in there that you go, wow, I never knew this. I never knew she was a Delta. I never knew she belonged to this organization or that organization because, I mean, what do we know about our grandparents, our great-grandparents? So I, I want everybody to make a commitment to try to find out, try to keep information, so you can give it to your children and your children. Because I hope that my grandchildren's children will be able to come here and see what I was able to collect. And it's very important to me. So if you don't want it, grandma doesn't want it, you can call Carol and I'll come and get it. <laughs> because I just think it's that important. Anybody else have any questions? OK, well, it was, OK. <laughs> Okay. Because I told the class about my favorite item in your collection. And I told how you continue to see you probably forgot it, but Which? Oh. Well, I mean, I love the both Buffalo Soldier. I, <laughs> I love the both Buffalo Soldier items. I, I got Buffalo Soldiers in New Orleans. 
New Orleans was one of my uh, haunts because I purposely changed my position uh, of employment to the airline. And the reason I decided to go with the airline is because I could go anywhere I wanted for free. So my aim was to get into that city, get a hotel room, drag one of my daughters who usually didn't want to go. Well, I promised to feed them and we'd look around and we would go through the shops and I went into um, an antique shop and he has a lot of nice things. And I said, well, uh, do you have anything else? And he was like, no, I don't have anything else. And his son was like, yes, you do, Daddy. <laughs> back there in the table in the back, you remember that stuff? And uh, he's like, oh, yeah. And he goes back and brings out a b box. And in that box is a 1871 10th Cavalry, the Buffalo Soldiers. Muster roll for the whole quarter all handwritten out, 24th Cavalry, Buffalo Soldiers. It's just this huge box. And I'm looking at it thinking, I don't have the money. There's no way, but I know he probably could see that I was holding on to the side of the table. <laughs> so I asked him, I said, well, I'm kind of interested. He told me the price. I, was like, I need this. I want this. Do you do layaways? <laughs> and he said, this is an antique shop, man. <laughs> we don't do layaways. I was like, sir, I flew here from Orlando. I'm going to give you a deposit. If I don't come back, you got the money. But if I come back, I got the goods, but I don't have that kind of money now. But I'll get it. He said, you have 30 days. You know that I was on a Delta flight right back to New Orleans <laughs> to get my things because I've done that everywhere. And in Orange County, they know me. A lot of shops that didn't have layaways, I was so persistent because I will wear you down. I'll just keep coming back and coming back. They would say, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to put it in the back. You have 30 days. And that's how I was able to acquire a lot of things because people stopped refusing me and started helping me. So now I get calls from all over the city of people who know where things are that I think I might want. I do not collect the way I used to because I have four storage units. And I don't know anybody, I don't know if you're probably too young to have had four storage units, but trust me, when you got four and a house full of stuff, you got a real serious issue. <laughs> So I will not ever turn down an opportunity to get an artifact, but I am trying to wean myself back so that I can find a repository for the rest of my collection. The library cannot house my plows, crab traps, shoe shine stands, barber chairs. They cannot house it. So as much as I wish they could, I've got to keep holding on until we can find a place where the children can come and see some of these artifacts. I will stay on this mission as long as I can. And then when I can't do it anymore, I expect somebody <laughs> to step up and say, I'll do it, Miss Mundy. I'll start helping you. Because we need those kind of people. I do. Yes, sir? One more. OK, one more, one more. <laughs> this is my favorite. Oh, yeah, it's a nightmare family, a story for my daughters. Um, I am, um, in collecting, I also ran across a lot of clan memorabilia. And when I first started seeing it, I was like, why would anybody want KKK cufflinks, tie pins, big old belt buckles? So I said, well, I want it. I'm going to start collecting clan stuff. So I'd go to flea markets and different places and see it, and if I thought it was affordable, I would buy it. One day, my daughters are home from college, and I get a call from a lady that I know in an antique shop, and she says, Carol, I've got some photographs. I think you're going to like them. 
And I said, oh, really? So I said to my daughters, I promise that I'm going to go in here, get the photographs, and then we're going to dinner. And they're like, no, uh-uh. We're not going to Winter Garden with you because we already know. I said, no, really. We're going to go to Winter Garden. I'm going to see Shirley. And then I'm going to get the photographs, and we're going to dinner. So we get in the antique shop, and I'm kind of talking to Shirley and wandering around. And she shows me a hood from the Ku Klux Klan. And I'm looking at it, and I was like, oh, man, that is really nice. She's like, I got a roll, but we cleaned it up a little bit. It's in the back. And um, we're talking about these things. And I was like, well, I think I want it. I think I can put it on a man again or something. So she gave me some other documents from the clan, and I'm buying this stuff. And my daughter comes over to me and says, Mom, I think we should leave. There's a man over there who doesn't look happy. So I was like, what man? And I kind of look around, and there's this tall, blue-eyed, blonde guy giving me the eye. You know how you get the eye? So. I said, well, you know, I have to finish my transaction and then we'll go. So she puts it in a bag and we get ready to go and she goes, Ma, I think we should go. Let's just go. Do you have to get that today? Can't you just leave it and then we'll come back? So I said, well, what's the problem? She said, I just feel uncomfortable. I, I don't know what's going on. He's walking up and down the street on his phone, coming back in. So finally, I'll wrap it up, and my daughters are anxiously trying to get out of there. And we get outside, and we are greeted by three gentlemen, one of which was the guy that was inside the antique shop. So on their faces was this fear that you see. I'll never forget the way they look because they're college students, I'm their mother, I've got a bag under my arm full of clan memorabilia and this guy's not happy. So they're asking me, what do you want with that? Where do you come from? Why do you speak like that? And it just got to, to escalate into something very ugly. So now I'm thinking, okay, how am I gonna get myself and my kids out of this situation? So meanwhile, I'm looking through the door of the antique shop and surely, is kind of looking and so I just kind of motioned and um, I told my daughters to go to the car which was only half you know not that far just go go to the car they're like no we're not leaving I just like go to the car go get to the car open the doors <laughs> get in I'm coming and for some reason this lady that I've known for a long time comes out and decides she's going to defend me. And she has one of the biggest guns I've ever seen. I don't know what that thing was. <laughs> and she, she's out there with her gun, and she's like, I grew up with you bigots, and I'm sick of this. This is my friend, and you don't come in my business. And I mean, she's a little lady. And she's waving her gun, and she told me, she said, you go to your car, and you guys better get out of here. And they looked at me, and they looked at her, and they, well, it was kind of unkind things, but I'd rather for them to do that and leave <laughs> than do something to me. So they started to walk that way, and I looked over, and they had the car ready, the doors were <laughs> thrown open. <laughs> And that was our experience with the Klan in Winter Garden. And unfortunately, that was about six years ago. So um, once again, I will not be stopped. Now, my daughter Kim, she's not going anywhere with me. She's not interested. She saw uh, in the paper that the Rainbow Club, anybody know where the Rainbow Club ever heard of it? It was this nightclub in Eatonville, Florida, where all the black entertainers that were on the circuit, the Chitlin circuit, came to entertain. And they also had a hotel in Eatonville that would accommodate them. And um, the family decided, after it had been closed for 10 years, to have it demolished and sell the land. And when I found out that that place was getting ready to be torn down, I called a friend of mine and I said, 
uh, she had just bought a van. I said, let's go to Eatonville and take pictures. She said, uh-uh, Carol, I'm not going to Eatonville because I know that you, I'm not going. I said, come on, let's go. You know, let's go to Eatonville. So I told her, I said, we'll bring some sheets just in case I try to pull something, just in case something happens. <laughs> so we get, we get sheets and things and bags, and we go over there, and it is full of furnishings and signs, and it was on. <laughs> I was all over that place. When I came out of there, I was filthy. But I have all of these wonderful treasures from that period that the family, once again, left all of his trophies, plaques, awards from the community, were hanging up on the wall that, like the place that just closed yesterday. So those kind of things are the reason why I have signs, chairs, all kinds of things out of closed businesses because they were left. But, yes, sir. Um, I want to post for example that just for your collection. I think there's a photo of James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Well, I got that photograph. It's James Baldwin, Sammy Davis Jr., and Martin Luther King. And I've got that photograph in New York from a photographer who was dying and his children were not interested in his collection. And he gave me numerous photographs, which I still have at the house, of famous uh, entertainers, civil rights leaders. And um, that's where I got that photograph. Um, he signed over the copyright to me. He was very prepared. Uh, I met him at a conference years ago, and he called me, and I came up. And it was so much. I wish I could have gotten more, but I do have some other photographs on that caliber of other entertainers. So, um, and that photograph is in special collections as well. Any more questions? You mentioned you needed help. Could you describe, like, if students came up, what kind of help they would be able to? Well, basically, I I'm a collector that archived. I don't only collect it, but I work very hard at preserving it. I've taken classes, I've gone to other institutions to try to learn how to make that happen. So as a result, if I find something, I don't just throw it into a box. I get acid-free folders, acid-free paper, acid-free envelopes, acid-free boxes. I put it in, I catalog them, describe them, and put them in a database. What has happened is I have an opportunity now to put them in a statewide database. I don't even know. It may be even national. It's, uh, do you know if Riches is just in the state? It may be. It will be worldwide database. Okay. It's worldwide database. And what I want to do is take the data that I have already created and transfer it over to Riches so that people all over the state and nation and the world can share in the information. It is very, it's very detail-oriented work because you've got to be able to fill in everything correctly. We don't want any mistakes in, in the database. I also um, am working on trying to make sure that everything in the collection is accounted for. So I need somebody that doesn't mind going into storage units with their laptop, sitting in an antique barber's chair, wherever you can find a seat, and help me to get it all into a basic database that we can then take that information and put it into something else. We are working on projects. Um, I, am, I am digitizing photographs, so if you feel like you want to go down to the Create, on Livingston and spent a couple hours scanning photographs. The, all of that would be helpful. I'm going to, uh, I have cards that I can leave out. You can call me. And if you have any research you want to do, because I do do genealogy. And uh, I am very heavy into genealogy. And if somebody's looking for their grandmother or their grandfather, or if they want to know where they came from, or see the immigration records, if you're not if you're from two or three generations from immigration into this country. So, um, but any help is always useful, and anybody that wants to be mentored into this kind of uh, research and collecting, 
I would be glad to show you how I do it, what I do, and how easy it is to collect something. I mean, I've taken people out for a day and they're like, wow, look what I found. <coughs> because it's that easy if you have a system and you know what you're doing. Any other questions? I'd just like to add for any students who are sort of trying to, or thinking about, well, how do I juggle doing something like this with my busy schedule of work and study? And <coughs> there's something in here that will make the, the trouble worthwhile. I can promise you that there is enough variety in this monthly collection that you will, within a matter of I just didn't want you to salivate on the document. <laughs> Because there's music, film, um, anybody that's doing anth um, any kind of work, there's something in the collection. Because I collected everything from straightening combs to Civil War dishes to photographs, tintypes, Bibles, anything I could find. So if you have an interest and you want to see, maybe it may not be for you, but I would like to think that you would want to try to see if there's something there that you could do or that you want to work with. Any more questions? Well, let me say that it was my pleasure always to talk to young people and everybody else that's here. <laughs> I, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity and I hope that somebody was sparked with some kind of interest, some kind of feeling that maybe they want to do something or find out more. So we are always available through African American Studies. I'll put my <coughs> cards out. You can call me. If you have questions about genealogy, I'll tell you how to get started. Um, I try to always be accessible to young people because I want to pass on the banner. So thank you very much.